And our, uh, our final session for the day is talking about the table stakes you need as a local journalism entrepreneur, what you need to bring to the table as far as skills, tools, the first steps, how to make it work. And we have uh, Uriah Kaiser from Potomac uh, Global, uh, Charlie Ann Lucas from Outcast SA, and Joe Hyde from San Angelo Live, who are going to tell us how to do it. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna stay awake because this is the last session, and I promised you it would be the most exciting because we have someone here from San Antonio. If you don't know what San Antonio is like, it's it's basically a city built around this dirty river, and they ride around with this, this big red boat on it. Tiny church in the Alamo. Anyway, I'm Joe Hyde of San Angelo Live, which is in the center of uh, Texas. If you can look at uh, the silhouette of Texas, that's where I am. I'm right there where the center of the silhouette of Texas is. We call it West Central Texas. And uh, we have a publication of, uh, it's been around since 2013. And uh, we have about the size, the same size as the VT Digger, all the numbers she was. Uh, Coming out with the same ones I have, about 230, 250,000 uniques a month, and you know, about 15 to 20,000 people a day. Anyway, Nowcast. Um, so Nowcast SA is in San Antonio, and we're, we like to think of ourselves as sort of like public television on the internet or a local C-SPAN. Um, we have done live webcasts from um, more than 360. Um, we've done more than 360 um, live webcasts from a couple hundred different places around San Antonio and in Austin, and actually uh, just uh, live streamed from a colonia in the, in the valley um, last week. So we've done it from a lot of different places. We have about 1,400 YouTubes on our main channel. And um, we also do maps. That's the other thing that's really important. Our most popular piece of content on the website is an early voting map, which tells people where to find the closest place to early vote. And it's been used by 184,000 different I'm Uriah Kaiser. I'm the publisher of Potomac Local News, PotomacLocal.com. We are online only outside of Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia. So uh, happy that this Virginia gentleman is happy to join Texans <laughs> on this site. How many people uh, in the room have a website? Oh, well, actually, a better question is how many people are actually thinking about starting one? So that leads me to believe that we already have them, right? All right, okay. So. Oh, the, the folks in TV land. Thank you, CA. Always reminded me. Um, so, so our so Potomac Local uh, just turned eight years old this week, and thank you. I'm still here, and if you're not eight yet or older, you can be too, right? Uh, and for so all of us who have our own websites in this room who decided to take the plunge to become local business owners in your respective communities. Oh, are crazy, and I applaud you for that, because to own a business, you have to be absolutely crazy. So thank you all very much. San Angelo was to build a mass appeal audience that everyone read. I didn't care about, you know, I wasn't taking sides, Republican or Democrat. I wasn't going to take sides for this particular click in town versus that particular click in town. I wanted everyone to read it. And the mass appeal audience concept actually comes out of radio. You know, what the radio station wants you to do? Hey, man, talk about KRBE all day long so that everyone thinks that I don't know, everyone listens to KRB. I'm talking some 1970s marketing, but uh, the mass appeal audience concept leads to what I what I call the um, uh, confirmation bias. If, 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 if your neighbor, or let's see, if you one of your clients, one of your advertising clients is on the golf course, and his best friend comes up behind him and slaps him on the back and said, "Hey, 
I saw your ad on San Angelo Live. That's the greatest form of confirmation bias that you get because it directly impacts your bottom line. Anyway, that's audience development and how you sell stuff. So when I, when I go talk to a client now, I say, well, well, what are your demographics? I just love that question because demographics don't matter in towns of 100,000 people, right? I mean, I know we were talking about F-35s a second ago, but I was a B-52 pilot before I started this. That's how I learned how to do advertising. And what I learned in the B-52 world was it's a heck of a lot cheaper to cluster bomb the heck out of it than to spend millions and millions of dollars on a bunch of individual JDAMs, right? So the target, if the target can be cluster bomb, cluster bomb it. Uh, and if you know, if you require a smart weapon to use it, you know, Uptown Dallas is too big to uh, economically bomb it, so you need to use smart bombs in Uptown Dallas. San Angelo, Texas, I can reach everyone with one B-52 sortie. All right? I hope that I'm probably going a little bit off the off the off the record, but you know that's that's the way I always look at it, you know. So. Um, I I think one of the things that um, folks, even if you're in the business for a while, um, one of the things that I thought was the most important to bring to the table when um, when I started Nowcast was um, partnerships, and those partnerships um, right now I have partnerships with all of universities in San Antonio, and so I've had interns, including interns who were not just journalism interns, but interns who were um, coding interns who worked on my website, um, interns who did, who were public health majors, who were just volunteers, I mean, all sorts of different kinds of interns, and that those partnerships with universities, um, to me, have been absolutely invaluable, and it also um, gives me an injection of, um, you know, kid enthusiasm. And, and seeing it through kids' eyes and, and stuff, which is really important um, uh, for me. Um, the Snapchat perspective. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so um, the other thing is, speaking of relationships, um, earlier today somebody made reference to um, founder therapy. And I don't, I don't know if this, I know it exists in other communities, but um, if you have one in your community, there's, there's something called One Million Cups. They call it um, Church for Entrepreneurs, and in San Antonio it meets on uh, Wednesday morning at Central Library. And in Prince William, where, I, where I'm an actual volunteer organizer of One Million Cups, we meet every Wednesday at 9, and it's a nationwide thing. If you're not a member, which it doesn't cost anything, it's always free. Absolutely. Become and a member of One Million become Cups. Become a member. Um, I, I told them the other day, when after something really wonderful had happened to Nowcast a couple months ago, I said to the, the guy who's the leader of One Million Cups in, in San Antonio, I said, you are the reason that we're still here. You kept me from giving up so many times. So That's fantastic. Um, that's, that's a great plug for One Million Cups. It's another organization uh, that I'm also a big fan of. Um, you know, honestly, I think uh, that one of the first things that entrepreneurial journalists need to know is that you're now in business, right? Uh, you're, you're always going to be selling something, right? Whether you're for-profit or non-profit, you're always going to be developing revenue. You're always going to be pitching something, right? And so I learned early on in the process, it didn't do me much good as a for-profit to go and sit in front of a business owner and talk about how awesome my journalism is and how I was the first to the scene and got the details the Washington Post just missed and and that was just a futile maneuver waste of time because the business owner doesn't really care about that all the business owner wants to do uh, is install trucks even if they don't want to buy that's that you said that earlier today but I've looked it up that's that's the whole quote. So read it again. Okay. So, so the quote that the CA is, is uh, reminding me to read is that people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch hole, right? So sell the hole. Uh, and so the business owner wants the result, right? They want the ROI, the return on investment. They want their phone to ring. So that's fantastic that you've got a great story and you're the best journalist on the block. But when you're selling, when you're asking for money, for profit, non profit, to support the ability to go tell more great stories like that, you gotta know your audience. So, so specifically, you know, most of us who do this are 
journalists at heart who want to chase the story and they don't so much want to chase the money. What tools and tactics do you use to force yourself to have that time that you need to chase money? Um, a, a very wise woman who did a lot of coaching for many of us who were in um, Night Community Information Challenge and stuff, Lisa Williams, um, uh, once upon a time told me that she referred to Mondays as Money Monday, and she would do nothing except if it didn't raising money on Monday. So you just don't do any stories on Monday, right. unless the right. world burns down. Right, right. And, and until you've raised some money, don't yeah. do anything. <laughs> well, otherwise you can't keep doing it. So right. 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 You know, it, it took me a long time to um, think about you know, my role as, uh, as a community journalist and, and my platform and where my news appears. And you know, I, I came into doing this from a daily newspaper, and I'll still admit that was the best job I ever had. Right, because I just collected a paycheck and I chased fire trucks all day long. And as long as I was filing six or seven stories a day that went up on the web and then got copy and pasted in the newspaper, I, my editor left me alone. Right, and so although I was picking and choosing what bills I wanted to pay that month because the paycheck was never what it you know, nearly what it needed to be, but um, that was the way I was used to doing things. And I knew that when I started my website, I had to have 10, 12, 15 posts a day to be relevant. And to compete with the newspaper at the time was still in existence. It's no longer that way anymore. Down the road, I learned that it wasn't my job to fill the internet with stuff to read. <laughs> right? And so I, I said to myself, well, what's the impact of my journalism? And if, if I, if, what if I spent more time writing a better story versus just more stories, right? And so what I started, what I did, what I do is I focus on the stories that, that I think will be the most impactful for our audience, spend time working on that, and then stop. Put the, put the writing brain hat, take the writer's hat off, and, and focus on the sales, because sales is a full-time job. You know, there's no such thing as part-time sales. You know, though we have to juggle many hats, I and mean, that's reality for most of all of us, is uh, part-time sales, full-time, they're both sales is a full-time job. You always have to be prospecting, you always have to be looking about uh, who you're going to pitch next, you always have to be putting more uh, potential clients into the sales funnel because eventually clients will drop out, they will not renew, and so you have to go and keep refreshing those. Uh, but if something is important to you, and believe me, sales is important to you, uh, you will make time for it. Joe, I, I don't think... I want to throw something to Joe on, on revenues. That, that, I don't that think he has any trouble finding time to sell things. No, no. So. But, but one, of the, one of the things that, um, that I got lax at, don't do what I did, um, in the beginning, obviously, I had a, a rather ginormous um, Knight Foundation grant that allowed me to think that I didn't need to think any further down the road, and so that all of my revenue was going to continue to come from grants, right? Um, and then, as time went by, we developed a whole, um, what do you call it, social enterprise of um, selling underwriting and um, sponsorships for live webcasts. And that got to a really healthy chunk of change. It, it was about $145,000 or $150,000 in one year. Um, but at the same time, that was also taking up too big a part of the pie. I'm making a pie here, right? That was way too big a part of the pie. So when a chunk of that fell off, I suddenly was in as bad a shape as I was when the grants fell off, right? So, so what I have come, I've learned from all of this is that you constantly have to be thinking of new revenue sources. It's not that, gee whiz, if I just sell, sell some advertising and go with Penny, I'll be fine. It's that I need to do that, and I need to do the underwriting, and I need to do individual donations, and I need to do grant writing, and I need to do obits. Obits. So. Dead people makes money. All right, so here's. <laughs> Here's the way you here's the way you do it, all right? From the, from the pro, what you have to do is you have to open up QuickBooks Online every day because everyone needs to be using QuickBooks Online. I'm not getting paid to do that because it has recurring billing in it, which is which rocks, which has saved me or made me so much money. But you open that thing up every day and you look at your numbers, and you got to figure out what your what you, what is my nut? What have I got to cover this month? And I know my nut, what I have to cover, and I figured it out for me to make a little bit of little bit of extra money and be happy, I need to do about a thousand bucks a day. All right? So that's what I gotta do. So if I'm not at a thousand bucks a day, tomorrow I better do two thousand, right? Or 
whatever I, I felt for. Or if I'm going to write this story on Thursday and not and no one's going to sell for me and I'm bringing a thousand dollars in sales, well, did I bring it in the day prior? So just kind of pace yourself that way. The other thing is, don't feel like you always have to be under the gun. You can uh, you can get to a level and maintain your expenses. Get to a level where you can coast a little bit, and and you know you you can kind of plan these little you know plateaus that you get to. That way you're not wearing your, yourself out. No, they're not vacations. You're just getting there where you have the monthly recurring revenue coming in. That's the last thing I'll say. Sell everything on the contract. Six months, 12 months. Because um, it's so much hard. It's, it's so hard to do the newspaper model without a big sales team. You know, the newspaper model is you go, you know, burn rubber on the streets. You know, you're hoping at selling daily placements in the newspaper. That's how they do it. You know, daily placements are $25, to $75. They all end up, you know, over time to $500, $1,000. Anyway, back to you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, sell by weeks, too, right? Because if you if you do by the month, there's, there are some sh shorter years than others, leap year, what have you, uh, you know. Uh, so, so we used to sell by the month. We actually now sell by the week and break it out. And it's the same price as if you would, you know, for the five. But it's easier just to say the week, for me, anyway. Um, you know, there is no one silver bullet, right, that's going to be the revenue saving uh, way to go, right? It's, it's, and, and so I'm, I'm talking about sponsorships, I'm talking about display ads, I'm talking about sponsor posts, I'm talking about reader revenue, which we launched in January. Reader revenue is, it's a, it's a, it's a revenue stream, right? But it's not the answer, right? It's not going to save journalism. When you say reader revenue, you mean paywall. So paywall, membership, subscriptions. Right. Uh, you know, I agonized for a year over whether or not I was going to implement a uh, reader revenue program. I'm still agonizing. Okay. Well, then well, once you get there, and, and uh, you know, uh, we, I, I decided that I didn't want members, right? Because a member will stroke you a check, and they will think that they're doing great things, uh, and they love your work, or they love the idea of your work and what you do, they may never, a member uh, may never come to your website. They may never read what you write. Just like a, a member of the, a member of an art society, right, that you know supports the local art house. They may never go see a show, but they feel better because they're a member and they pay 50 bucks for the year, right? I wanted subscribers. You know, I wanted people to pay me six bucks a month or $65 annually and expect journalism that's worth their money. Right? And if they didn't get it, I expect them to tell me that they're not happy. And if they don't, if they're really not happy, they're gonna walk, right? And I think that's great. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's ownership on their part, I think, that, that we need, you know, in not only the local sphere, but the national sphere. People need to know where the news is coming from. People need to, uh, engage, right? Uh, I'm not saying they need to, you know, be, or, you know, talk to us every day, uh, but I, I think through subscriptions, I think through building relationships, I think that's a great step forward. Not everything we do at Potomac Local goes behind the paywall. Uh, if I write it, it's going to go behind the paywall uh, nine times out of ten. Uh, if it's a quick hit, copy and paste press release, it's going to go, uh, uh, you know, for everybody to read. Not behind the paywall. And the other thing that I'll note when we talk about reader revenue, it's actually changed um, the way that I approach coverage, right? So I'll give you an example. Interstate 95 is, is a main thoroughfare in our community, right, right down the East Coast. And the entire a portion of the highway was, was shut down uh, due to a brush fire. And in DC, if you been through DC, you know the traffic's pretty awful. And so when 95 gets shut down, traffic gets even worse. And I was actually working on an investigative piece that afternoon, and I heard that the road was shut down, and I have my drone sitting over here, and I have my video camera sitting over here, and I'm not that far from where you know this is, and you know, I I could have went down there and spent the whole afternoon shooting video, talking to witnesses, going on scenes with the guys, the fire guys that I know. Um, and I would have had a blast, right? I would have had the best time ever. Uh, instead, I tweeted about it, posted something to Facebook, said to avoid the area, that's about it. And I kept working on the investigative project that I was working on, which in the end 
netting me about four new paid subscribers. Because the, the, the balance there, it's like, well, I can invest hours into this story in my afternoon, but tomorrow morning, what's the what's the shelf life value of this story? That's a completely ephemeral story, right? Where you're going with the one that people can read for weeks. Excellent. What, what I want to know from you guys. What's that? Right? What I want to know from you guys, because you're good salespeople. How do you close the deal? What are your magic words? And what do you not do so you don't screw it up? Um, two things that have worked. Um, one is that um, when I'm going in for something like right now, I'm, I'm, I'm selling um, our coverage of League of Women Voters um, candidate forums for the rest of the year. And my what I need for that to do live streams of every single one without you know missing a beat is probably about thirty thousand dollars. And so um, going to um, different people who I think are, are good for it, or at least for a chunk of it, to say, this is what I need. I need $30,000 to do this, this incredible public service that you can be part of. Um, you know, are you in for 30, 20, or 10? Well, first, first thing is you have to say, so, so, so you're not asking for a yes or no. Yeah, you're saying, join the mission. How much are you giving you? And join the cost. Right? Join the cost to get these. Debates, these forum debates, which are in San Antonio, they ought to be pretty good. Oh, they are. <laughs> um, so you asked, what is it that you do at the end yeah. to close the sale? Or, or, or what, what, what is your, what is your advice to completely avoid because you'll kill the okay. deal? Don't do this. Okay. Yeah, don't Both do this. questions. <laughs> All right. So it's not necessarily what you say; it's how you approach your customers. Um, mentioned that they're not buying the drill, they're buying the hole, right? That's a metaphor, right? A metaphor, right? <laughs> well, let me explain to you what the hole really is. Um, a, a advertising client local market is a guy who's a little bit unsure because you don't know. You don't have the scale of 15 pet shops to cover up a bad day, a, you know, a bad month at your, your store. You're buying someone who's, you're selling them reassurance. You're saying, you hook, you hook your wagon up to me, and I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to put my arms around you. I'm going to hug you. I'm going to make you feel special. <laughs> and you're and you're going to be okay. You're going to make that 940 payment to the IRS. You're going to make your payroll. That's what you're selling. And if you approach your customers, like, I'm going to put my arms around you and hug you if you give me money, uh, they'll, they'll spend it because you get to just understand what you're selling. What not to do, one of the problems you have with a small publisher is that you're writing stories that are controversial and you're making these people mad. So I have like, you know, half San Angelo at any given time is mad at me. But over time, they'll come around. You know what I'm saying? They'll, they'll flip flops. Because the issues, every issue you have out there, you're going to have the different sides come down on either side of the issue. So once you get through a couple of big news story cycles, I think that kind of settles down. But that is the toughest thing. So you guys, and now that I'm a little bit larger, I have to be careful about what I do right. I have to, like, if it's something I don't really, like, I don't want to be going to the courts and writing about a child sexual assault case anymore. I have, I have kids from Angela State University. Do that. Well, how, how do you handle somebody who's really peeved by that last story you wrote and you're trying to close a big deal with this person? When I was at the Dallas Morning News, I'd say, hey, dude, that, that was the editorial department on the fourth floor. Don't punish me. <laughs> <laughs> right? If we can't do that because we, we can't do it. We're in that you write a stack of hats. Yeah, there's there, there's no there's no wall of separation of uh, publisher or sales and editorial. So you have to be able to something something that I mean I've heard here a couple of times. If you write it, you got to stand by it. You can't just throw out stuff or uh, throw things on the wall and let it see if it sticks or whatever. You got to believe in what you're writing, and then you have to be able to kind of defend it. But then the other thing is you're just going to have to let some of these sales go. And if they're big ones, I mean, I, you know, there's there's a lot of reasons in small markets people don't advertise or will advertise with you. For example, we do a really good job with the, these three car dealers. These other two car dealers feel like we're on, we're in the other guy's uh, team or whatever, so they go, well, we don't know how they're going to the team. Uh, an interesting case in point is my wife works for a real estate office in town. 
Well, there's a real estate office that won't advertise with us because my wife works for their competitors. And I just loved it because I got to tell my wife, I said, Judy, you're the reason why these people won't advertise. It's not me. It's not me this time. So, anyway. One, one more thing to, to close it, um, because I don't have the world's largest number of page views, and I don't have those kinds of numbers to sell to people. Um, so one of my flyers um, lists all the organizations that are sponsors, and um, and it's everything from AARP to um, you know, Life Night Foundation and and some 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 organizations that are really really well respected in town, and so. The, the sell there is that you too can be one of the really, really cool kids. When I was still working in print, um, I walked into the newsroom, picked up a copy of that day's paper, and saw a mugshot of our newly hired publisher on the front page. And he had gone, uh, I guess he left his wife and kids at home that night and went to the home of his girlfriend and started throwing rocks to start at her window, and then they just the fight escalated from there, right into the cops were called. And on that day, I learned that not even the publisher was immune from the front page. And so I have used that uh, in my discussions with business owners, elected officials, uh, potential clients. Uh, wait, wait. You said you were on the cover of your own. No, my no, my so just to just to back up. <laughs> when I was still working in print, I walked in and found my publisher's oh. mugshot on the front page of the paper. And and I've always said, if if I'm the one that gets popped with DUI, or I'm the one that goes and starts throwing rocks at somebody's window and the cops get called, you can get guarantee that my face is going to be on the front of PotomacLocal.com. And it's going to be a very embarrassing day for me. It's going to be a very bad day for not only me, but for my family. And that statement gives them pause, but it's also a very honest statement. And it's, in some way, a selling tool because you're, you're connecting with honesty, right? And so, Dylan, to answer your question, that's how I do it. Go back to the, what, what is your magic Closing phrase. How do you close the deal? I don't. I mean, I, I think that if you've prospected, right? If you if you know what the company does, right? And if you communicated um, what you can do for that company, you know, what what reach you can deliver, right? Um, they're either going to want it or not, right? And so I, I don't really have. Anything other than does this fit your budget, right? Do you have a budget for this? You either do or you don't. Um, and you, you, I, you give them. I, you heard me talk at, at length about my product, and I understand that you told me because I was good enough to ask what your needs are, right? And so I can, you know, I can satisfy those needs. I can fill those gaps in your business to help you. Um, you know, I've answered every objection, and a good salesperson will try to answer uh, objections that may come up before they even come up, because I found that during the sales process, uh, during, during the pitch, if somebody has a potential objection, but they're going to wait until you're done, they're going to just focus, they're going to hone in on that one objection, but wait, it doesn't do this, or it, this might not work, and they'll totally tune the rest of your presentation, they'll tune it out. And, you know, if you think about that, like a, a cigarette butt that gets tossed into a, a pile of leaves, you know, what's going on in their mind there, that, that cigarette butt is just smoldering and smoldering and just growing, that fire begins to grow and grow and grow, and by the end of the by the time you're done talking, you've got a full-on force fire. And there is no way that you're going to put it out by that time. And so that's why prospecting before you get the set, before you actually go to the set, right, and, and, and you make your pitch, knowing a little bit about what they need will go a long way because then you can answer those objections, address them before they even come up. And to that end, I would say um, remedial um, replaying of Eleanor Sipple's um, videos from, from past Lion conferences. Well, that's
last thing you say to a, to a customer to close the deal, you give them the price. Sir, to reach 75,000 people in San Angelo, Texas, I can do it for you for $2,500. Is that too much? And here's the deal. The first one to talk after that loses. So let him come back with a, with a counter or go ahead and just shake his head and say yes. If, and, you, and if, you, if, you start, if you start right. talking, you're just going to start undermining yeah. your... The first person that right. talks, after you've thrown the price out there, the first guy that talks loses. You're going to lose. In fact, that $2,500 you want, which is a hypothetical, I'm not saying that anything yeah. costs $2,500, but so you throw $2,500 out there because it sounds good, everybody wants a $2,500 sale. Throw that out there, and you start talking, you're going to talk it down to $1,500. I guarantee you. But if you keep quiet... You'll probably get to keep about two grand of it. <laughs> just to, uh, sorry, right. I was going to say, just to chime in, just on the sales piece. Um, so you can do it in person, and uh, a lot that can often nerve some people to be able you know, to throw the number out and then let that silence hang. It's a beautiful thing, I love it too. But um, it, so as other publishers, sometimes they'll have like a proposal process. They'll, they'll leave the meeting and be like, all right, we'll tell you what. I understand what you, what you need here. Um, let me put together a proposal. I'll come back, right? Put together a proposal, and then now you can introduce a sense of urgency and say, like, all right, look, and this is where it gets a little more hardball. And you say, look, um, if you're willing to come on this week, if I'm willing to commit, then I'll do whatever it is for them. So I want a little extra bone, just something that says, okay, I need to make a decision by Friday. And then you follow up, like, hey, are we going to do this? And then it's just kind of like get them to make a decision. So. I mean, that's just another tactic, too. So, so I don't pass the mic right over, but um, so I, I love guesses. Love guesses. But I appreciate no's, right? Because once you get the no, you can move on. Right? You can get, and then you come back to them six months later with something new that they might say yes to, right? But a no is extremely valuable. Um, not, as, not as great as a yes, but a no is very valuable. Um, the other thing that Joe said, everybody wants a $2,500 sale. Yeah, everybody wants a $10,000 sale. Right? Um, but the thing that, that you need to know as a publisher is you need to not uh, price your product too low. right? Because when you go for a sit and they're just looking for a reason to throw you out. Right? They're waiting to hear something that they can say, um, well, that's it. Um, you know, they're, they're look, so it goes back to those objections. And if your product is priced too low, it may not or probably won't do what we need it to do, and there's not a great value to it. So thank it's you very like much. A dress. Uh, it's like it's a cheap dress. That's Joe's cheap dress. Yeah, you wouldn't buy a cheap dress, would you? You'd, rather, you'd much rather pay $150 for that $25 dress. Right. Or, or buy a good will for 10 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> but then, but you know, when you buy it for ten bucks at Goodwill, you know that dress is going for one sixty-five. Exactly. Makes sense, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, um, one of the other things that that I do to help close something up, um, and and it's not on advertising sales, but um, on underwriting. So, uh, somebody comes to me and says, "Well, give me a give me a bid of what would it cost to to underwrite this event," and um, I've got a price out there. Um, and I throw the price out there, and I throw the estimate out there, and I say, but 10% discount if you pay by X date, and that's the day of. So, which also helps keeping me from being <coughs> Mr. Repo Man again. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just end with this. And this whole, what I, I know about this. Have confidence in your product. Uh, one of the ways that I've gotten confidence in my products, I run a lot of programmatic on it. We have a lot of traffic, so I'm able to write, I'm able to Experiment a lot with programmatic from Google Ad Exchange and AppNexus. I know what people on exchanges are willing to pay for to be in these ad slots, and that has given me a renewed hope. I'm like Kenny over here, he doesn't like banner ads. I have a renewed hope in banner ads, especially the big ones. Uh, but uh, knowing that on Google Ad Exchange, some of my ad slots are going for $10, $12 uh, CPM estimated, uh, helps me not price myself. If I can say, dude, I can sit on my rear end, not sell a thing, all right, and still make that kind of money. So you either have to pay it or, you know, I'll run uh, Revlon ads from Google. Anyway. And the, the other thing, if 
major nonprofit, you know, you've got to get a board that that is bought in. Right? You've totally got to get a board that's bought into your story and they're out in the community telling that story every single day and to the point to where they had, they say, hey, I'm on the board of directors with this publication and we're freaking awesome. Right? Because if you don't have that, then you might want to rethink the structure of your board. Because there are people out there who will support you and they will want to tell that story if you, if you give them the proper motivation and tools to do so. And that will do huge for your sales and your awareness in the community because people want to, not only do people want to read good stories or stories that are good, right, and, and that, that's, that's interchangeable, to, well, not, not so inter interchangeable, but people want to become involved you know, if they hear good things about the organization. So we're not saying tell, write only good news stories that make people smile, we're saying, do great journalism, and that, I mean, honestly, before I get way too high on my soapbox, I think that's what's going to save community journalism. It's not going to be reader revenue, it's not going to be ad sales, it's not going to be, it, it's going to be people who get involved, it's not going to be programmatic, it's not, <laughs> it will be people in communities doing great journalism, right? And the more people that you have talking about the great work that you're doing, the more people are going to want to buy in and get involved. Whether that's board members or business owners or the mayor or, or what have you, now, that's going to take your business to new heights. That's something I wanted to add to your um, reader revenue um, uh, comment a bit ago. Um, I went to work for the street.com in 1999 and uh, they became profitable in about uh, 2000, uh, two, two or three years later. And one of the ways they did it was a reader revenue thing. So the street.com, it was it was the, um, on the model of the American Express card, right? So the street.com is free, and that's the green card, the American Express green card. And then I was actually managing editor of Real Money, which was the next level up. That was $2,500 a year. Then there was another level up that was that was uh, somewhere in the vicinity of uh, $5,000 a year. And then there was another level up, and you got a, a faxed um, sheet first thing in the morning that came straight from her green book that was you know, three three great tips, and that was like $25,000 a year. Um, so it was never everything behind the wall, but it was that, that billboard out there that was the street.com showing you stuff, but then saying, hey, but you can get even more valuable information, and it was. It was, you know, it was, it was from some guys who were right on the front lines um, who were doing this thing called columnist conversation, which these days we, we call it Twitter. Right. Um, but it was a long time right? um, and, and right, but that was twenty five hundred dollars. So I mean, there there are all sorts of different ways to do the reader revenue thing that don't necessarily involve putting in the mechanics of having to count. Oh, you're up to your twelfth story. You can't read anything for free anymore, or you know, but but to layer it like um, American Express. My competition is San Angelo's Gannett, and they have a paywall, soft paywall. And there's a set, and they call it soft paywall when they let you look at like five pages, and that's the they want. The whole idea behind the big corporations right now is just, I, mean, I don't care how much, if you, you, you're paying 20 cents to, you know, buy a subscription for the first month, and then after that's 20 bucks a month or whatever it is. Um, their whole idea is make whatever you can on subscriptions. It really has no value to us personally as newspaper organizations. We just want to make money off the readers who are attracted to our brand. And so they'll sell their food subscriptions at whatever price. It doesn't matter. So they consider themselves making money out of, out, of, out of clear blue air. So right now, my business, because I'm in that market, as long as I stay free, that's a competitive advantage for my advertisers and everything else because the Gannett paper is going to start banning people after five pages, which makes them unrelevant in that market because I'm out there, or irrelevant, unrelevant. I like that word better. <laughs> But anyway, I, it's not a matter of. Okay, that copy editor would probably let that one slide through. Yeah. I, was just, I, was just try, I was just trying to be like different. But uh, anyway. Do they have any more copy editors? They're all gone anyway. No, we don't need copy editors anymore. We have AI. Well, that doesn't have any more. <laughs> but anyway, there, I think it makes the paper less relevant. How's that? I've just three ways I can say that. And because they're less relevant, they're, they have less opportunities to sell advertisers because no one wants to be somewhere where they're not relevant. Well, 
Well, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here, but I have one more little prompt for you guys if you'll bear with me. If you're like me and you keep doing a pretty lousy job at sales, what are like the first three steps? Tell, tell me, what are the first three steps I need to take to go get the wheels spinning to what they should? First step is if, if you're not good at sales or if you are good at sales, right? Um, do not jump initially to building a sales team and don't feel like I gotta go get a salesman. This is something Scott Rybeck and I we've learned. We've learned the hard way. We try to build sales teams around our product. We try to motivate them and get them out there, rah rah rah, creating products for them to sell, things like that. What we both found was we are both and for our respective publications our best salesmen. And so my, so my whole take, my strategy right now is to extend to me, not to build a sales team that's not me. It's, I hired, a, basically I hired a girl who can sell just as well as I can, and she makes whatever I make, you know what I'm saying? So her commission is based on what my sales are. So she's kind of like my sales, if you're in the newspaper, you remember you had the sales assistants that kind of put together the whole plan. So she's a sales assistant on steroids, because she can actually go to the client and close the deal. So we work together as a team on that. We both, in fact, this month we got a goal, and we hit our goal. We're both going to pay ourselves. And I'm going to pay our, pay us both a thousand dollars each if we hit our, 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 our sales goal. So, now, so you're giving her a cut of deals that you close that I'm she worked on as well. Yeah, I'm basically saying we're a team. You're going to get paid based on how well the company does, and our comp plan is set and set up so it's not going to make me go broke. Uh, it's still very that generous. might be a good idea. Yeah. But that's the other problem with sales teams. You set up these comp plans and go, well, man, if I just had another $40,000 on the books, I'd give you half of it, right? Have you ever thought of that? Don't ever, ever give half of it to the sales team. I always think my rule of thumb is my sales operation shouldn't cost more than 33 and a third, you know, a third of, of the cost of, or of the revenue. That should be your money. That's kind of where I try to keep it. And that will give you an idea where you can keep your commissions and things like that. Because you realize, you got to pay paper clips, and you got to do the billing, and you got to do there's a whole bunch of other infrastructure stuff that you have to pay for as a company too. So don't give a sales rep thirty three and a third. Don't give them the whole budget. Keep some back for the company. Run the run the ops. All right. Um, Scott, you mentioned that you have a lot of people that are in the sales Person to, to undersell it or unsell it in your head before you go in there. You know, when I was when I started out in sales, uh, you know, I would get I didn't have the confidence in the product, and so I would say they don't have it, they're not going to buy it. 
look, I saw their ad in this other publication anyway. Don't ever say that you saw an ad in another publication because then if they were at work, then why would they buy one from you? Um, but it's your job to go in there and, and it's not your job to undersell in your, in your mind. It's your job to go in and show them what you can do, tell them how you can be an advocate for them, and ask if, if they want to do it. Um, my, my latest is um, to say to people, you may not know me, but you know my video. And last year, my video changed the outcome of the San Antonio mayor's election because my video showed the now former mayor of, the, of San Antonio saying the cause of poverty was people out of touch with their creators. And we need support so that. That's not true. <laughs> 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 let's, talk, let's spend the rest of the time talking about religion and politics. Yeah, religion oh, yeah, and politics, no, let's start. No, no, we have two minutes. No, so many are banging down there right now. Please, can we have a secular conversation about, about politics? <laughs> I, don't really have, I don't really have much to add. I mean, you guys are saying it all. And, uh, I, I'll say something. I've more. never had, I, I, I started working in TV, so I'm always fighting for airtime. Yeah, um, you know, it. When I started my site eight years ago, uh, it was a, and still is, a general interest news publication. And if I had it to do all over again, I might have selected a, a, a chosen beat, right? Whether that be the schools or transportation or uh, the courts or just maybe just breaking news, who knows? Um, I, I, I may have done that and then built other sections of the site as I grew. Right? Instead of just trying to cover it all and do what I used to do and try to put out this huge image and, and be bigger than I really was. Cover the entire general interest area. So, so instead of just drawing a, and looking at a county map and saying, okay, everything that falls between these lines is what we're going to cover. Uh, I you know, might have selected a, a beat and did that beat really well. And if I wanted to grow my business because... The, the numbers were growing up and the advertiser interest was there, uh, I would have maybe then added another beat. So, um, you know, no one raised their hand in this room that says they're thinking about it. That means you're already deep into it. Uh, but never, it's never a bad time to evaluate and reevaluate your approach and pivot, right? We pivot in business all the time. I have been in business for eight years. And, uh, you know, when I went with my reader revenue, I promised people that we would report more in depth on traffic and transit issues, right? If I could give you back potentially 30 minutes of your day uh, and, and tell you what they're trying to do to make their commute, my wife commutes three hours a day, round trip, right, from our home to her job. But she works 30 miles from our house, right? So that gives you some sense of the 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 issue, and if I can give you back the hope of 30 minutes or more in your day, is that worth $65 a year to you? Um, I, that's not something I would have said when I started my website. I would even thought about charging you to read content when I started my website. That's sacrilegious. No one does that. Pivoting is part of business, and it's never a bad time to evaluate and reevaluate your approach. And it's only a fail if you don't learn. I'm real good at sales, so what I did was I hired an editor. That way, I didn't have to do it. Now, I'm not that saying I'm not bad writing. I'm not a bad writer, but I mean, I hired I hired someone who wrote like me, you know, to take over to take over that piece of my brain, so I didn't have to worry about it. But I mean, I, through the years, it's gone through. Like sometimes I'll hire, I'll hire a strong salesperson, and I, I'm, I end up being the strong guy doing the editorial. Through the years, it's gone different. But my first, when I jumped into it first, I had a very strong editor chief who just took it and made it her own, and I took care of sales. Thank you guys. That was very uh, helpful for me, at least, and I hope for everybody else. Thanks. And uh, we should also, uh, again, thank the folks who make this happen. And uh, first off would be uh, Steve Beatty and uh, Matt Beaver, who made it so we could, uh, they really could all work pulling this together. And thanks to our funders, the Knight Foundation, the Democracy Fund, uh, Ford Foundation. Help me out here, Matt. I, I don't want to forget anybody. And uh, Broad, ethics and Excellence. The most important Broad, Broad Street. And Matt Kenny from Broad Street. And uh, I think I unfortunately followed on Facebook. And, and uh, thanks to uh, Doreen for her.
coming and uh, encountering what we uh, threw at her as well. And I think uh, very shortly we are going to buy everybody a drink down at the bar, mm -hmm. as soon as we uh, break all this stuff down, and uh, a little bit of food too. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. So the sushi place, I'm not sure if it opens. Um, it may not open until five, but we'll be down there in a few minutes and ready to ready to go with the credit card. All right. and, and remember, uh, pencil in your calendars, or uh, if you still use a paper calendar, or type it into your calendar. Uh, uh, October 11th through 13th, all three days, full days in Chicago. Again, thank you, everybody.